Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It is good to be with the saints. I mention that every Sunday. It's not an empty uh, statement. It's, it's a great thing to be with you in this church and to do what we're doing, which is what the Lord would have us to do, and that's study His Word. And I think we see a great emphasis on that and the importance of it from our text this morning where Paul talks about the many gifts that Christ has given His church and how He won them at the cross and how we're to use them. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through verse 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Now, I want to stop and make a comment on that verse because I really don't say much, if even anything, about the captives that He took with Him. It's from, the, it's from one of the Psalms, and, and David is speaking of the victory God won over all of Israel's enemies, and Paul sees the fulfillment of that in Christ and what he did on the cross. So who are these captives? He doesn't tell us. It would seem from the psalm that they're the enemies that have been defeated, but uh, there may be some suggestion from 2 Corinthians that uh, the triumphal the march that Christ made after his crucifixion was uh, his people whom he took captive and transformed into his sons and daughters, I think it's probably a reference to the enemy. As Colossians chapter 2 talks about how Christ uh, dealt with the demonic forces, Satan and all, and just his enemies in general. I think it may be that Paul isn't interested in that. It could be the one I, I lean toward the enemies. But I think what he sees here is just the complete victory of Christ. And that's what is so uh, compelling to him. And it would be a distinction between those and his people his, uh, that, to whom he gave gifts. And he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to us, as Paul explains. Verse 9, now... This expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. There is an expression that's sometimes heard from college coaches or found on the pages of business books that gives us the point, or at least the sense of our passage, it is grow or die. One of the mavens at Forbes had as the heading of his article, in business you're either growing or you're dying. Coach Lou Holtz said, 
In this world, you're either growing or you're dying. So get in motion and grow. Well, you might expect that from a motivational speaker. Paul wasn't that, but he did give counsel to Christians to be growing together in the church. And there's no alternative to spiritual growth. That's the counsel he gives in our passage in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Previously, Paul's instruction was to preserve the unity of the church. But unity is not all. In, in unity with one another, we need to grow from spiritual immaturity to maturity and greater usefulness. So now his instruction is to pursue growth. But he gave it with more than a simple, so get in motion. He gave specific directions. He informed us that we have the means to do it. God has given gifts to us for that very purpose. Remember, the Christian life is a supernatural life. It is of God. And God has equipped each of us so that we might help one another develop spiritually. Churches that don't grow, I don't mean in size, but maturity, they do die. They become cold and lifeless, useless. That's a warning that's repeated to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So Paul begins his instruction in verse 7 by informing the Ephesians that God has blessed the church with gifts for service. Service for Him and service for one another. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The grace Paul wrote of here is not saving grace, but enabling grace. It refers to spiritual gifts. Now, this isn't the word that Paul normally uses for gifts, but it's clear from the passage that uh, that, that is his meaning. A spiritual gift is not a natural talent or ability, but supernatural ability. And there are two things to notice. First, it is given to each one. Every Christian has been given a spiritual gift and equipped by Christ to serve God. Secondly, we don't all have the same gift or the same number of gifts or the same amount of gift. Gifts are given in different degrees according to Christ's sovereign will, according to the measure of Christ's gift. He measures it out. It's according to His will and His design. But we are all gifted, which is surprising for some Christians. Gifts are not limited to church leaders. They're given to each one of us, as Paul says. Paul explained that in the rest of the passage, but first in verse 8, he explained the origin of the gifts, how it is that Christ obtained them for us, which Paul showed from Psalm 68. It is a prayer for deliverance. It's a prayer for salvation. It begins, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Then David describes how God defeated Pharaoh and how he defeated the kings of Canaan. And then Paul quoted verse 18 of the psalm here in verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. And the Hebrew text actually has, you have received gifts among men, but uh, a conqueror received gifts from the conquered in order to give the spoils of war, the spoils of victory to his people, his army. Abraham did that after he defeated the four kings of the east in Genesis 14. He kept nothing for himself. He wouldn't let the king of Sodom 
boast that he'd made Abraham rich. So he, may, he had won this great victory, but took nothing for himself. But he did give gifts to his retainers, to those who fought with him, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Paul saw a similarity between God's victory over Israel's enemies and Christ's triumphal return to heaven after his victory at Calvary over his enemies. Who? Well, as I said in the reading of the text, we don't have that defined, but I would say over Satan, over sin and death. I think Chrysostom in, interpreted it that way. But over his enemies. And now, enthroned at the Father's right hand, he has given the Holy Spirit to the church. And with him, spiritual gifts to all of his people. Every one of you. That's how Paul applied the psalm in verses 9 and 10. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? In other words, the fact that Christ ascended into heaven indicates that he previously descended from heaven into this world through the incarnation when he became a man. Now it's at least that. I think that's I think it's just that. I think that's what Paul means here. He's speaking of the incarnation. Uh, others have seen more than that, interpreted the statement into the lower parts of the earth as either the grave or Hades. And each one of those has uh, some justification. So I won't quarrel with that. But it was on the earth and on the cross that Christ won the victory through His death when by His obedience to the Father's will, he voluntarily offered himself up as a sacrifice for his people and gained them for himself through that death. As a result, God highly exalted him, raising him up from earth and a humble state that he was in the incarnation to the highest glory, far above all the heavens where he is enthroned as king filling all things, as Paul said. That was the purpose of Christ's ascension above the heavens, that He might fulfill all things. Well, what does that mean? He fills the church. Paul stated that back in chapter 1, verse 23. It could, could have that idea. That may be His meaning here. But this is a different context. This is a cosmic context context. So it's far broader than that. It means that he, as the triumphant and glorified God-man, now fills the universe with his presence and power. Not in his humanity. His humanity is seated at the Father's right hand in heaven, but his deity fills it all. But it fills it all as the victorious Savior of the world, who redeemed his people and because of his accomplishment at the cross, will redeem and, and glorify the entire universe. He is all-powerful. He is the Almighty and has authority and the liberality out of that great power and authority to give gifts to his people. He's king. He rules. And he gives us the spoils of victory, everything that he won at the cross. They're listed, these gifts, in verse 11. This is one of uh, four lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. The others are in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Peter 4. So if you want to re remember where the gifts are found in the New Testament, you remember uh, two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 4. There are over 20 gifts listed in all, but here in Ephesians, only four are given. Verse 11, And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And you say, well, that's not four, that's five. But I'm taking pastors and teachers as one gift, as I will explain shortly. The first two, apostles and prophets, have been called foundational gifts. 
Because in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul stated that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles were the authoritative founders of the church, and to carry out that mission, they had special power to perform miracles. Paul reminded the Corinthians of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, where he recorded that the signs of a true apostle were performed among them by signs and wonders and miracles. Miracles were their credentials. They backed up the things that they said. In chapter 3, verse 5, Paul stated that both apostles and prophets gave the church God's revelation. So they were essential for the church to have guidance and stability in those early years. Neither of those gifts continued. They're called the foundation of the church. A foundation is laid once. It's not laid continually. Everything's built upon that once for all foundation. So neither of those have continued. When the canon of Scripture was complete, when the New Testament was complete, prophets ceased. And when the church was established, apostles ceased. One evidence of that is Acts chapter 1, verse 22, when a replacement for Judas was being chosen. It states that a requirement for being an apostle is that he was a witness with the others, the other apostles of the resurrection. In fact, there it's stated he must be, have been with the ministry or seen with the apostles from the very beginning, from the time of John the Baptist to the ascension of our Lord. Well, that pretty much rules out most people after the first generation. But he's witnessed the resurrection, and in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1, Paul affirmed that his, his apostleship by writing, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Well, yes, he did. He saw him in, the resurrect, in his resurrection glory on the Damascus Road. Well, such witnesses were obviously necessarily restricted to that first generation of the church and have not continued. They were foundational. The foundation of the church has been laid and those gifts have ceased. Now I know there are people today who claim to be prophets and apostles. That's nothing new. There have been people like that all through the history of the church. Martin Luther had to deal with those kinds of people more than once. The Zwickau prophets and others. And they caused great mich mischief during the Reformation. They occur, they occur all the time. But can a person who claims to be an apostle say, I've seen the resurrected Christ? Well, they can say that, but did they? What did they see? Do they have witnesses? Were all the others there to witness it, the other apostles to witness this? You could say, well, I saw him like Paul did. Paul witnessed him on the Damascus Road. He wasn't with the, the apostles from the beginning. Well, Paul had witnesses there. The company that was with him saw the light that Paul saw. They heard the voice. They didn't understand it, but they saw the phenomena that took place at his conversion there when he was struck down and blinded on the road. They helped him back. Do you have people that have seen all of that? I suppose they could say yes, and I suppose they've said yes to make their claim, but then you say, okay, well, what are the signs of an apostle? Have you done those? Have you given power so that the lame can walk? Peter did that at the gate called Beautiful. He, he gave Aeneas power to walk when he was on his way to Joppa where he raised Tabitha from the dead. Have you raised the dead? Paul did. Raise Eutychus. Let me see those miracles. I don't think people can produce that today. Look, the scriptures I think are clear that those gifts have ceased. 
What hasn't ceased is this second group of gifts continued in every generation of the church, that, that of evangelists and pastors and teachers. Evangelists are men who have a special ability to, to make the gospel clear and relevant to unbelievers. Often they were the traveling missionaries in the early church. Philip was an evangelist. In Acts 8, he, uh, it stated that he took the gospel up to Samaria where there was a, a, a great revival. And then, interestingly, the, the Spirit of the Lord took him out of there and took him down to Gaza where instead of preaching to multitudes of people and seeing mass conversions, he preached to one man. He preached to the Ethiopian eunuch and he became a believer. Evangelism, evangelism can happen anywhere, in church or outside. In the 18th century, the first great awakening began in the Anglican churches in England. When the crowds got too large, Whitfield moved into the open fields where thousands came to hear him. Estimated size of the crowds were like 20,000 people at times. Evangelism can happen in the office. It can happen in the neighborhood. There are all kinds of ways and places to exercise the gifts. Timothy may or may not have been an evangelist, that is, may or may not have had the gift of evangelism, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul urged him to do the work of an evangelist. And I think we're all called upon to do that. Uh, Peter in 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, Always be ready to make a defense to in everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Well, you would hope that they see hope in us. There's something different about our life, our demeanor, the, our conversation. And they say, what is in that person? What is their hope? And you they ask you in one way or another, and you're able to give an answer. That's evangelism. But there are certain people, men and women, who have a special ability to give the gospel with clarity and effectiveness and to be God's soul winners. Finally, Paul lists <clears throat> pastors and teachers. That's really one gift, as I, I suggested earlier. Two aspects of the same gift, the gift of Pastor, teacher. I, I, would, I would write it out, pastor hyphen teacher. Uh, the grammar indicates that. I hate to get into grammar, but it's necessary sometimes. In the Greek text, each gift is de has the definite article, the, the, the word the, which isn't translated in, in the English text, but, but if it were, it would translate the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, but there's only one article for both of these words which would seem to join them together in, into one gift. And also, the Greek word and that's used to join the, uh, the two words together is different from the conjunction and that connects the other gifts. And so that word and between the word pastor, teacher is called a copulative chi. It joins words together. Charles Hodge stated that there's no evidence in Scripture that there was a set of men authorized to teach, but not authorized to exhort. One function includes the other. That's what the pastor teacher does. He explains the Scriptures and on that basis exhorts. He gives instruction and guidance. He differs from the evangelist in that his ministry is generally more localized in a church and differs from the prophet who gives revelation while the teacher explains the revelation. Again, th this is an abbreviated list. As mentioned earlier, there are two other major passages which list spiritual gifts, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. And there are various ways to classify the gifts. But in, in 1 Peter 4, Peter seems to classify them into two groups, speaking gifts and service gifts. 
He wrote, whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. Whoever serves, let him do so by the strength which God supplies. In other words, serve by the grace of God. He is giving us a constant supply to do it. Supernatural. Well, speaking gifts would include the gifts of teaching and evangelism, but also the gift of exhortation, which is listed in Romans 12, verse 8, which, which is a gift that gives wise counsel to people and guidance to people and, and does so in a way that urges them to, to follow the wise way. Service gifts would include the gift of helps and a gift that's called service. I think that's doing work behind the scenes. Uh, the, the gift of giving is another, using one's finances to support the ministry. The gift of mercy is, is obviously one of those service gifts, caring for the sick, the disabled, and the grieving. Um, really, in fact, all spiritual gifts are service gifts, but but um, there are certain ones that are sort of behind the scenes and, and give physical material as well as spiritual help to people. They are given, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, for the common good. It's a very important principle to remember. No gift has been given for personal edification. All of them have been given for edifying the church. They go out from us, and that's how we're to use them. And there, there are many others. As I said, over 20, and each of us has been given at least one, maybe, maybe more, but at least one. Verse 7, to each one of us grace was given. What an amazing thing. I, I don't want to get to take up too much time, and this is off script, but... Uh, the, the church is a brand new society. Some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Uh, there, there is in Christ no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. But there are all those people in the church. It doesn't mean that was all wiped away. There were slaves in the church. Onesimus was a slave. Probably the church met in his master's house, Philemon. And just think of this. He was gifted. And I suspect he was gifted with teaching. So here this slave sits down in his master's house, and then he stands up and teaches his master. And his master listens to him and takes notes. It, it obliterated these terrible distinctions. Not all are terrible distinctions, but that, that particular distinction, and I think it had an effect on removing slavery to some extent. But that's the new society that God's grace creates. And, and all of us have been gifted. It's a gift of God. It's not of us. It's His work. And so, verse 7, to each one of us, grace was given. But Paul was not concerned here to give a complete list of all of the gifts. He gives the, the four that were fundamental to the growth of the church. Those that convey, convey revelation and explain biblical instruction. That's the, the principal means of building up the church, which is the lesson that he's giving here. It's restricted to that. There's nothing more necessary for spiritual growth than teaching, explaining the Word of God. And that's, Paul, that's what Paul indicates in verse 12, where he states the reason God gave these teaching gifts to the church. They, they are not an end in themselves, but a means to the end. It was for the equipping of the saints for the work of service so that the build, to the building up of the body of Christ. Now that's an important verse for understanding the church and its ministry because it shows that ministry is not the work of one man, the pastor, or an elite group, the clergy. 
but involves all of the church, every one of you. John Stott has some good words on this. He explained the traditional notion of the church as modeled after a pyramid. With one man, the pastor perched, he said, precariously on the pinnacle like a little pope in his own church while the laity are arrayed beneath him in serried ranks of inferiority. I like that. He says that's an unbiblical image. As is the model of a bus in which the pastor does all the driving while the congregation are passengers slumbering in peaceful security behind him. The New Testament doesn't support the idea of a single pastor. And we, I know it's common vocabulary in the church, talk about the pastor. The pastor is not an office. There's no, no mention of the office of pastor. It's a gift mentioned here in our text. A kind, of, but he's not, there's no, as is the analogy that's sometimes given today, a kind, he's not a kind of CEO of the church uh, with a, a, a passive slumbering congregation. Neither one of those ideas is biblical. It, it, Bible teaches a plurality of leadership and oversight and the involvement of all the saints using their gifts, what Mr. Stott called an every-member ministry. And to illustrate that clearly, Paul's model for the church is a human body, a body made up of many parts with different functions, but parts that all work together in harmony and unity. That's what a healthy body does. That's characteristic of it. Paul calls the church the body of Christ because Christ's physical body has ascended far above all the heavens in glory. It's not here. So we are His representatives on earth. He is our head in heaven. We are His body on earth. A body is one thing with many parts. It has unity and diversity. And each part has a necessary function. There is no insignificant part of the human body and no insignificant saint in the church. We all have our function. We've all been gifted to serve the body of Christ. Evangelists and teachers have been given to the church so that each member will be adequately equipped to do that service. The word equipping for the equipping of the saints is used in the Gospels for the, the fishermen, the disciples, mending their fishing nets, fixing their nets. It was also a medical term used at that time, used of setting a broken bone. So the idea is that of fixing flaws in the saints, strengthening character, making a person useful in his or her life and in serving the Lord. Biblical instruction is necessary for that. It's necessary, it's essential for sanctification, for spiritual growth. John Stott wrote, Nothing is more necessary for the building up of God's church in every age than an ample supply of God-gifted teachers. You need more than one. I think he's right. They are not the end, but the means or agents to the end, which isn't to have a knowledgeable congregation only. You need to have a knowledgeable congregation, but that's not the end of it. That's not the whole goal of it. But, but having saints fit for service so that we can get in motion and grow, to quote Coach Lou. If we're not growing... We're shrinking, if not dying. So it's necessary that we be nourished, that we be fed spiritually, equipped for every work of service. The inevitable result of that is maturity and unity. That's how Paul puts it in verse 13. We, we need instruction for equipping. 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Unity and maturity go together. We reach maturity as a church through unity, which we achieve, which we achieve through mutual concern for one another and ministry to one another. And Paul shows the importance of that in the final verses. Without maturity, we're like naive children, undiscerning, unstable, and easily influenced. That's, that's not a criticism of children. Naivety is part of being a child. They are impressionable susceptible to fads and fashion, always wanting the new shiny thing. It's where we all begin. All of us have been there. That's where we begin. But we are to be progressing. We are to be growing out of childhood into adulthood. When we aren't, the problem isn't, as Leon Morris put it, that we are childlike, but that we become childish. And Christians can become childish in spiritual matters. I've seen it. You've probably seen it. They, they can be mature in regard to their career and in regard to some wisdom, uh, worldly type wisdom, which I'm not disputing or discounting, but they can do, be that in terms of their career. So they can, they can understand finance and they can understand medicine, but be completely naive about God about his purpose, and about his will, about his plan for the ages. Paul described this immaturity as being carried about by every wind of doctrine, intrigued by spiritual fads, interested in the apostles today, or something like that, vulnerable to wolves, and, and um, continually pulled off course, off what Jeremiah called the ancient paths. The mature Christian, on the other hand, is steady and discerning. He or she has knowledge and understanding of the truth and knows how to use it in the church and to help others develop. Paul encouraged that in verse 15. He said, but, instead of being, uh, being carried about by every wind of doctrine, he says, but speaking the truth in love. Uh, that's, that's a, that is a disjunctive, that word but. It, it makes a contrast indicating another course from that of being enticed by, by foolish ideas. Rather than being carried about, we are to be people who are speaking the truth in love. Literally, it, it's something like truthing in love because this Greek verb is connected to the word truth and includes, I think, both action and speech. So the meaning might be uh, broader than speaking and include action. The idea of, being, uh, of both speaking and living the truth. It's as we show and tell the truth in love that the Holy Spirit changes people, changes us and, and the Christians that we serve to give growth and bring the church to maturity, to make us like Christ. We as a church, as a whole, need to grow. We do that individually, of course, but we're joined together, and as we mature and minister to one another, the whole church matures and grows. What, what, an, what an interesting place this church is, is located in on a side street that most people just drive by, but here we've got the uh, Orthodox Jews in their synagogue to the west and to the south, the Mormon temple. What an interesting place to be. What, we should be a light in this community. But we can't be a light if we're not a mature church, and we need to be growing, and that light needs to be seen. That'll happen as we do what Paul is saying here. And so 
minister to one another and that gives growth to each individual which gives growth to the church and makes us like Christ. Paul wrote that we grow up in all aspects into him, into Christ who is the head. So again, Paul was using the image of a human body to describe the church. It's, it's living and growing and here he said it is growing up into the head. Now that's a difficult picture to imagine but as commentators have pointed out, a baby's head is larger in proportion to its body than the head of a grown-up to his or her body. <clears throat> so the idea of growing up here means being, bringing the body into the right proportion with the head. And the church is to be doing that, growing into the right proportion to Christ, developing, maturing, becoming like Him by growing. Now, in verse 16, Paul wrote that the growth is from Christ, from whom the whole body is being fitted and held together. That's a present tense indicating an ongoing process. He's always supplying us with growth producing life. It's His life in us by virtue of our union with Him, being in Him, that very important expression that we find throughout the book of Ephesians and throughout Paul's literature. In Him, in a vital relationship and union with Him. We're joined to the second person of the Trinity, meaning we're joined to the Trinity. And we have the life of God within us. And He supplies us that we can do these things. But it occurs, this growth occurs not only because we're in Christ, but because we're joined together. It, it occurs through our union with the saints as well as our union with Christ. We are described as joints that are fitted together. We are every joint of supply, Paul said. And because we are all connected like parts of a body, Christ works through us, supplying us with His grace as we use our gifts and serve one another with mutual assistance. <clears throat> That's how the church functions. One great example of that, at least to my mind it is, is the love and care that John Newton gave to his friend William Cooper. Think of this. John Newton was a cruel man. He was a slave trader. When God arrested him like he did Paul on the Damascus Road and changed him into a man of grace <clears throat> who loved the weakest of the saints. And that's what William Cooper was. He was a brilliant poet, a hymn writer, but a weak and troubled soul. A suicidal person. But Newton, who lived near him, and was his pastor teacher in the town of Olney, spent time with him. They would go on walks together almost every day and talk. And Newton encouraged him to write hymns, and he's given us some of the great hymns that we have. Even after Newton moved to a church in London, he wrote to Cooper regularly, always speaking the truth to him in love. The church needs people who will do that very thing because that is how the Lord equips us, heals and strengthens us. It's with the truth. Now the application of all of this to us is obvious, isn't it? You have a gift, maybe you have more than one. Do you know what that gift is? Are you using it to build up the saints? The Lord's design for the church is an every member ministry. We've all been equipped to do it. Maybe your gift is hospitality. That's mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verse 13. If you're one of those who is happy to meet people and, and greet them, then use your gift to, to speak to a stranger here in the service and, and be an example of that to us. And don't be surprised if that stranger's been here for 20 years and... We've all had that experience, but it's a, nevertheless, it's a great act and a warm thing to do. And 
It's warm and welcoming, and that's who Christ is. He's a warm and welcoming Savior. Didn't turn people away. Well, maybe your gift is exhortation. That's in Romans 12, verse 8. Exhort us to be obedient to our ministry. Consider, as the author of Hebrews said, how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We will do that as we grow together in Christ, united in love for Him, which generates love for one another and a desire to do what lasts for all eternity. Let me say that again. What lasts for all eternity, the work of service, is something that has eternal reward. May God help us to engage in that. Let me conclude with the gift of evangelism or the work of an evangelist and invite any who may be here without Christ who have not believed in Him to come to Him. Know that you are lost, but you may be found through faith in Christ. He's done the work of salvation and invites sinners to recognize their need to be reconciled to God, to make peace with God. You do that by turning from unbelief to trust in Christ, whose death paid for the sinner's sins. All who trust in Him are forgiven at that moment. They are received into God's family and equipped for ministry. And to the rest of us, may we all, by God's grace, be growing up into Christ. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 15 in the pra- hymns of praise book, A Debtor to Mercy Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Number 15. <clears throat> Father, we are that, debtors to mercy alone, but by your sovereign grace, we've been saved, and we give you thanks and praise for that. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.